This is Keys to the Shop, episode 312, how to make the best equipment decisions for your shop with Chad Little of La Marzocco. Well, hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. If you haven't yet subscribed to Keys to the Shop, it's real easy, and I would love it if you would. Just hit subscribe right where you're listening to this podcast, and you'll always be up to date with new content as it comes out. Main episodes on Tuesdays, the uh, shift break, uh, short format episodes on Thursdays, Founder Friday, Rate of Rise, roasting episodes. There's a lot of great content coming out, and so I want you to be up to date. So thank you for doing that. And also, when you hear these episodes and something really, uh, you know, makes you take notice and you think, wow, that's really good, I would encourage you to share this with a friend or share it with your team, somebody who you think can benefit from it. That would help get the word out about keys to the shop to more coffee shops and more baristas and professionals. And I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Now, Keys to the Shop, on top of doing this podcast, also offers consulting and coaching for you and your business. And what that is, is me working directly with you to help you either start your business off on the right foot, or if you're an existing business and want to level up your operations, your management, and your quality, Keys to the Shop Consulting can come alongside you and help you remotely or on site through cafe assessments. And I would love to talk with you in detail about what you need and how Keys to the Shop Consulting might be able to help you. To do that, just email chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C H R I S at keys to the shop.com. We'll set up a free discovery call and talk about if keys to the shop consulting is the right fit. Again, that email for keys to the shop consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee, one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers that curates the most amazing equipment that you can find from all over the world and works directly with you to help you make the right decisions for your business. Every business is different. Prima knows this. That's why they put such an emphasis on working with you on this critical decision on what equipment to get. And right now, when you go to prima-coffee.com slash keys, you can get 5% off your entire order by using the code keys5 at checkout. That's K-E-Y-S and the number five gives you 5% off your whole order Really great deal there, and if you're in the market for commercial coffee equipment, whether that's espresso machines, grinders, brewers, or even things like under-counter refrigeration, Prima Coffee is the place to go. Learn more over at prima-coffee.com slash keys. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Barista Series from Pacific. This is a line of plant-based performance beverages that have taken the world by storm and are seriously the standard for excellence when it comes to plant-based beverages. They're designed for and by the best baristas in the world. And because of that, they'll stand up to the heat from steaming. You can create amazing texture with any of the beverages you choose from this lineup. Uh, Perfect for latte art. And also keep the beverages focus on the coffee. So it's balanced. It tastes amazing, performs well. I mean, what more can you want from a plant-based beverage? And uh, your customers are going to really appreciate you serving this because they know you've put a lot of thought into giving them the best. Go to pacificfoodservice.com to learn more. Get it in your shop and try it for yourself. Again, if you're looking for the best plant-based beverages to serve your customers, then you need to be serving them the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everybody. Well, today we are going to be talking about espresso machines. And uh, it really, we're going to be talking about a framework and philosophy and approach to selecting your equipment that will help you get both what you want and what you need and what your business needs. There are a lot of ways that you can find out, you know, technical capacities of equipment and, you know, maybe how many groups you need and things like that. But what you can't really get is the kind of wisdom that you're going to receive here from our guest, Chad Little of La Marzocco. So Chad Little handles the sales and business development for La Marzocco in the Midwest of the U.S. and has a long history in the coffee industry as well as the culinary world. For five years, he was the owner and operator of an audacious restaurant called Arbor in Logan Square in Chicago. Uh, In the coffee world, he has worn many hats from technician and educator with Counterculture Coffee to business developer and manager at Ipsento 
along with a host of other roles in the world of uh, fine dining and other coffee businesses since the late 90s. His goal is to help people bridge the gap between knowing what they like and knowing what they want, and beyond that, helping connect the dots for people who want to make a difference or be a part of a solution and don't know where to start. Chad also has the pleasure of using his skills that he's developed over all these years to work as an advisory board member for a workforce development and entrepreneurship organization for disadvantaged young people based in Chicago called Workforce High and Meta24. And like I said, in this conversation, we are going to be uh, tapping into the wisdom that Chad has developed over his years in the culinary world and coffee and helping customers through his role in La Marzocco select equipment that works for them to help them achieve what their goals are, uh, both personally and in their businesses. So as we discuss things, we're going to be talking about common misconceptions, how to understand equipment's proper role in your business practical considerations that you should be looking at when buying your first machine or upgrading from a machine that you currently have, and how to balance wants and needs in the ever-changing life cycle of your business. There's a lot of great nuggets of wisdom here, and I'm really happy to have gotten a chance to speak with Chad about these things. So let's get right into it. Here now is my conversation with Chad Little of La Marzocco. Well, hello, Chad. Welcome to Keys to the Shop. So glad to talk to you today. How's it going? Great, man. Yeah, just uh, enjoying enjoying the city. I'm hanging out in Kansas City right now. Yeah, you're on the road for La Marzocco, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I wanted to just kind of launch this conversation a little bit, uh, talking about um, your own career in coffee a bit. You kind of grew up both in coffee and the culinary scene a little bit. I know you're yeah. a restaurant owner or a former restaurant owner. And you've got a lot of coffee background as well. Uh, talk a, a little bit about where you've been in coffee and how you've kind of grown up in the industry to where you are now. Yeah, totally. So, you know, I'm originally from the West Coast. Uh, I mean, my my grandparents and such grew up in Chicago, but uh, yeah, I, I grew up in in Arizona largely in in the coffee scene was pretty disparate in a lot of ways. Everyone travels by a car out there. So um, I remember hearing little early murmurs of Starbucks because one of my dad's best friends was the basically the regional director of like developing that market. So, you know, it's like, I remember the Folgers jingles, you know, every morning, uh, you know, wake up with Folgers in your cup, like all that sort of stuff. So I was like, I was down with that. Uh, I grew up in a very multicultural family. So, um, I just, I feel like, oh, coffee's killer. Like it, it touches on so many different backgrounds and cultures. And um, so I never really pursued it as a career. It was more something I enjoyed. I enjoyed the connection uh, with communities. And then the culinary arts, I'm very drawn towards the aspect of creating memorable experiences for people. The, the kind of limitless that you can achieve with just, yeah, the culinary tradition. So. I kind of fell into that, um, but you know, timing-wise, I would say late '90s to early 2000s, uh, money was very fluid. You had a lot of outlandish behavior. So I remember working at a restaurant that was like an eight million dollar build out, and someone came in and bought a twenty thousand dollar bottle of cognac and just sat on the shelf. And it's like this is absolutely not one of what I want to be a part of. Um, it just felt like 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 doing things for. Uh, the, the sake of perception, not about actual, the things I was interested in. So coffee, it was literally uh, the specialty scene was popping. Like I remember seeing Stumptown, a buddy of mine was from Portland and, and we were studying in school in England. And he was like, yeah, like check this out. And it was just super cool. But at that time, there weren't many jobs. So it was really hard to get a job at those places. So I would just buy the coffees. Um, and I actually, my first job in coffee was actually Starbucks way back in the day. So, uh, yeah, I basically was like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to run a business um, from their perspective and worked there for a number of years and, uh, yeah, and enjoyed that, but moved on to basically taking a role of uh, business development and, and uh, managing a little shop called Absento in Chicago. And right. I remember the, the struggling uh, $400 days. Uh, not, you know, knowing what we were doing, all that. And we had a little Diedrich uh, up front and then it's like, oh, we do a thousand bucks and then we do 2000, 3000. And you think like you're killing it. Uh, but I say all that to say, uh, I didn't know what I didn't know. 
you know, I remember going and visiting my buddy uh, CC at Ritual in San Francisco and sitting at a cupping table with him. And it was like, oh, like these coffees are legit. And I didn't know that, you know, I was bringing him some like slightly faded coffees. And, you know, it's just it's a part of your journey. So that was cool, man, just to see the, the, the change and the evolution and the growing up. And I really didn't really start to see the career aspect until, you know, I worked with, um, you know, different companies, counterculture. I worked for, for a little bit and I saw companies like Verve blossoming. It's like, oh, like there's actually some runway here. So, you know, essentially went down that path and ended up starting a restaurant for a number of years. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, so we basically did tasting menus a few nights a week, changed the menu every every uh, week. Uh, and then I did all the wine program. And then we had a cafe component during the day. And then we also did catering, like huge 500 person events and weddings. And we had a farm. So basically I didn't sleep. It was just always <laughs> crazy, crazy amount of energy. Um, but yeah, I learned a lot. You, you kind of see, I can do this, but am I actually wired or skilled to do this? Uh, you know, you kind of, I, I would say even this guides my philosophy in hiring and like business development. Like I seek to understand the person of who they are, not just like what they say they can do or what's on their resume. And the best way to do that is like when your back is against the wall, who do you become? Like, how do you show up? And so that was, uh, yeah, man, that, that journey kind of showed me that, but yeah. And I ended up deciding, you know, I want to prioritize family and decided to move away from that business and, um, sold the shares of that. And then was thinking a lot about product development organizations and businesses that I think have a global reach, but they're small enough to make a, an impact and um, you don't get caught up in too much of the uh, myriad of, of politics and things like that. Um, so Lammer Stoker came to my mind and I just hit up a couple of friends who I had worked at the company and um, asked if they had any openings and really there was nothing open, but I just flew out to Seattle and asked for a meeting and then listened to some of their problems and they graciously explained where they're at. And then uh, Andrew, day day who's the general manager uh he's been on the the, the podcast that's right he uh him and i've been you know started talking for about four months and just volleying back and forth uh a lot of ideas about product development business development culture um strategy things like that uh and uh yeah ended up creating a role for me and then the pandemic happened so there, <laughs> there we are it was a uh, pretty gnarly every story on this show that yeah, we do now is is punctuated somewhat at the end of by saying and then the pandemic happened oh dude yeah. dude it's no joke I, I mean literally i was in seattle and then i was in uh you know new york right like right during coffee fest when it was it was happening and oh. you know it's just yeah man it's just one of those uh one of those things but very grateful very thankful i didn't mention this but you know when i think about like what's unique about the coffee industry and a lot of people they've come up in it and seen things and, and a number of people have no clue where it's come from you know uh, i would say, i would argue a lot of people who are getting in the industry now have no clue who peter giuliano who jeff watts like they don't know who these people are um and they were they were really harbingers of a certain thread of the industry you know when i when i look at businesses who can grow one thing that i think is really important is the prioritization of people like do you actually prioritize taking care of them and that's that's something that I, I, I like love as a as an opportunity in coffee like you have the opportunity to do that supply chain wise at the farmer level your barista level but also the people you're serving so um that's the part that like gets me most probably excited about it mm-hmm. so yeah no that makes sense you know i think the uh equipment side of things that you're involved with now is is very interestingly connected to the people side and in some ways people might not think so because it's like you buy equipment the equipment works or it doesn't work and it doesn't really you know it's sometimes seen as more of a point of frustration or stress and not necessarily something as dynamic then as I think it is. And I think that you must think it is as well, because Mm. it really does resource you with the ability to sustain those relationships that your business is revolving around. Um, 
I mean, how did your, in, in this role, how do you see your experiences working in hospitality and being focused on people sort of converging with equipping people with the, the nuts and bolts literally <laughs> to do what they do? Before I really get into that, I remember growing up and hearing, okay, uh, if you go into computer science, like you're going to be good, you're going to be safe. And as things started evolving, I recently was looking at my kids thinking, man, if you can actually understand user experience and user experience design, you're going to be fine. Because no matter what product is developed, no matter what industry, it all hits that point for where the user or the consumer or the human interacts with that product or service or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the extent to which you execute that and kill it, you will do well, um, potentially. Um, and i.e. Carvana, i.e. Robin Hood, like whatever, you know, yeah, right. we focus on the tech, but if you actually look on the user experience side, they kill it. Like that's, that's what they do really well. So when I look at a product and the equipment, that's a huge thing I think about, like, are you just innovating or designing something that looks cool or offering some service, but trying to sell versus trying to truly serve and make that person's either joy with that thing like more pleasurable or or just like yeah man they're having fun like they 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 it does the purpose that it's seeking to to serve and it's also um a kind of a community like an envelopment like i met all the lamarzoco people way back in the day when i didn't know anything and i was literally calling up their solutions department because i mean i don't want to mention names but there's another manufacturer we had at Epsento. it was super busy and the machine was having a hard time keeping up on um, it was temperature and then just just certain components like the solenoid was based underneath the drain tray and ugh, dude, water dripped on there and like sparked. I mean, it's just crazy. So anyways, I was like, all right, I got to get one of these Lamarzoka machines. Shout out to Jonathan Jero from uh, Harbinger. He was like, yo, oh, you yeah. should uh, check out one of these. Uh, you should find one. So I literally bought one from a salon in like <laughs> like suburbs of mm -hmm. Chicago and it was all like broken so i took it all apart in my apartment this is like 2009 and and i didn't do i didn't know what i was doing i was just looking on their website looking at parts diagrams and then i called up and i started talking with roger and scott Gulamino, and uh, they were just like oh yeah you should do this you should do this and little by little i started learning more and more and ended up fabricating a machine with a buddy and wrapped it in walnut and learned a bunch through that process but it was the human dynamic that made that really uh memorable and even to the point when i was at counterculture and at with the uh, arbor it was like uh there was a there was a connection point so i think that's the other sensitive part that we have to think about when when you know you pick up those nike shoes or you drive that car or whatever it is you are kind of enveloping yourself in a whatever culture or relationship and some of them are in some ways like self-serving like those products and then some of them they almost like seek to be a other kind of community like a patagonia if you will so it is kind of a weird world because you don't want to say it's more than what it is but you also if the aspirations are truly to like yeah we want to build something great but we also like we want to celebrate people and all that like there's companies that do that and i think at this day and age people are seeking that um so that's the hard part there's going to be i think some hoodwinking and people trying to like oh i want to do this but they're actually not delivering um mm. and so anyways that, that's, that's good uh, yeah i was it, it makes me think about how one of the ways that you can show you really care about somebody is that you uh offer you know, those resources or just support or help them succeed in an area that they value that uh, is is deep and meaningful to them. And so I get what you're saying about having there's self-serving elements and then there's community serving elements as a, yeah. the opposite of that, where you'd have to really be tapped into the community to know that people who use what you're producing are really at the heart desiring certain outcomes. Um while at the same time, you know, you're kind of up against some misconceptions that people might have about what equipment can do or should do. Totally, so totally. I, I wonder if you could break that down a little bit and talk about 
common misconceptions about machines and what they are expected to do for a business um, and and kind of shed some light on their their role in that way? You know, I guess in, in some ways, one thing I see popping up uh, pretty often is they they kind of minimize the prominence or the importance of uh, contextual training, like for their space, like whether square footage or proximity to a highway, things like that. And they assume that that piece of equipment is just going to solve their flow issues or it's just going to solve their like throughput issues. It's like adding another group isn't going to solve your uh, espresso grinder taking eight seconds to grind 18 grams like that's yeah, you know right. like you're like that's that's not it um and and the hard part is like some manufacturers uh, of various products will just kind of give this silver bullet solution it's like it's never solving anything um or or you know another one i'll see is when people are purely reactive and servicing and then they're surprised when something breaks um it's like it's a product and we live in a world that things break and things corrode. So um, if you're not taking care of it, like it's, you know, everything's going to break at some point. Yeah, I would say another one is people not having like the right sized machine for that volume. You know, it's like, a, I don't know, a two burner range and you're trying to um, uh, do a bunch of like a stir fry restaurant or, you know, it's like, no, you need six burners or eight burners. Or if you're doing a breakfast restaurant and you have a 12 inch or 16 inch griddle, it's like, no, it needs to be 36 or 48. Like mm -hmm. that is the mainstay. So, you know, just understanding the right assets for what you're seeking to do. And then, you know, at the, at the end of the day, uh, the hard part, I think it's just, do you actually care about that and being honest about your, you know, about that dynamic. Some people it's just, oh yeah, yeah, this is great. I need an espresso machine. And then, you know, a good example, let's say a hotel and they, they say, oh yeah, we need a coffee bar and they're going to go to the person that they know. And then they're going to say, oh yeah, just set us up. And is that the actual like setup that they need? Or is that just available to them? Or, you know, what about locally? Is, do they have a good access point for service? And then not even starting with uh, I would say what is actually very crucial, and this is kind of like one of my own little, let's say mantras, but um, just how I, I, how I perceive in life. Uh, I want people to make decisions on real things. Like I want it to be based on the essence of what is presented, not get wrapped up in fashion or sentiment or um, marketing in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the coffee world, it's uh, elements of metallurgy, um, engineering design, water pathways, temperature stability, build quality. Like these are all <laughs> real things that a lot of people don't really have a, a sentiment or care for them, but they actually like the result of them, you know? So that's, that's kind of something it's like, all right, like if you only want to buy this or pay for this, then, um, this is what you're going to get. And so not expecting more out of the product than what maybe its intention was. I mean, that, that's like a whole other conversation right now. You, you talk with old um, technicians from, uh, let's say, working on refrigerators. And they say, oh, yeah, if you had a refrigerator built in the 60s, like where the compressors were built, the way those were engineered, like they're going to last. You can actually rebuild them. And nowadays, uh, a lot of manufacturers will design things that are failing mm -hmm. within five years. Yeah, playing off the lessons. Exactly. So that you, it's like short term business development, long term business development product cycle um, and, and organizations aren't publishing this information. So the savvy user needs to kind of look through the weeds. Like, what are they trying to do? Like, what are they, and, and then pay accordingly. Having the perception correct. That's, that's basically what I would say. Okay. So we know that we like the outcome. We know that we, we, we look at, even if we've never been in coffee, we look at other people who are in coffee that we want to emulate yeah. or inspired by. And we say they have this machine and obviously this is great. And we should totally. that. Um, and, and, and my mind goes to being a first time home buyer, for example, and then mm -hmm. feeling like, okay, you know, this is cool. This was a starter home in a sense. Um, but it, qu it quickly becomes apparent that you may have, uh, too little house for as much life as you actually have. Right. Yeah, As yeah. Your business grows, so like your family grows. You know, you need an extra room. 
but without having the lived in wisdom of in that being That's right. in the house, it's hard to make that decision before it actually happens. What kind of practical Dude. considerations <laughs> can people make in, well, uh, t- two types, I guess. One person who's not opening yet or is not opened yet. And another yeah. one who is, they both have different points of view, but what are the practical considerations that they need to to make when they say, when you say, look through the weeds and, and yeah. look at what you're, you want this machine to do? A lot of people are just like, well, I, I want it to make coffee really, really well. Right. But there's a lot more to that. So you touched on like one of my favorite things. Uh, uh, you you were just talking about like, oh, I, just, I'm, I need to live in it. And today's I think day and age with, with just this obsessive, crazy amount of information overload that people have, uh, they're told what to like feel and think instead of like, just experience it. Just, just, yeah. Like, what, what do you, what do you think about this? Um, I used to do this all the time with wine when someone would come in for restaurant, the restaurant and they'd have a seven course tasting menu. And I would ask them like, Oh, like you into wine. And it was as if I asked them what their like religion was or their their preference in like some crazy intimate regard, I got like two polar opposite responses. It was either, oh yeah, I know this, this, and this, and this. And more often than not, it, it resulted in they, they knew like five brands or maybe a varietal in an area, or it was as if they, they just wanted to say, no, I don't know anything because they didn't want to be held accountable. And I'm like, yo, like, let's just navigate this. Let's taste. Um, I'm going to present something to you and I'm going to give kind of a short declarative sentence and a little access point for you to feel free to express yourself. And, and it was awesome. Like in a, a good barista, a good bartender, they do that, you know, they do that well. And so when I think about a machine or even in your example, a house, um, it's, it's kind of akin to what led to Apple killing it. They designed stores where they allowed their product to be prominent front and center and people got their hands on it. It wasn't about reading in some magazine or going to a Best Buy or something like that, like they curated that experience. So I would say if you don't have that opportunity um, to go to some showroom or maybe befriend a cafe owner and ask them like, what's going on and would I be able to come by? Then I would say start high level. Like, what do you value? Um, Is it design, aesthetics, uh, user experience? Um, You know, like, like, or is it maybe, hey, I just want to work like reliability. Um, and then sometimes we're just not rational. We're just like, I don't know. I just, I just, I just like the way this one works or functions or looks. Uh, so that's, that's fine too. Um, the other, the other realm I would say is before you start that little journey, I remember when I was designing out this restaurant, you have so many crazy lines of like needs and products and, uh, segments, everything from plumbing distribution, electrical pathways, uh, heating and cooling. Like there's so many things that you need to make decisions on. And I quickly realized not everything can I go down the path of exhaustive research and analyzing the best probable outcome. Like I have to basically understand my appetite for a decision within that category. Does it have a long-term or short, short-term, uh, effect like negative effect? Um, if it was short term and it didn't cost much, then I'm not going to overthink it. But if it costs a lot and it has a long term uh, kind of challenge or effect, then um, it is in my best interest to like research it and, and get my hands on it and, you know, kind of take the industry like standards uh, and, and very point blank. La Marzocco, we have to like be very honest and open about that. Like we have it working for us where, yeah, like it's tried and tested. It's, it's, you know, respected, it's appreciated and all that, but competition is great. Like it, it pushes forward innovation. It pushes forward, um, you know, certain elements of stagnation. And, um, yeah, so we, we basically, we love that part. And I, I think for the benefit of the greater industry, we have to kind of be champions of one another. And instead of this, uh, more, I don't know, like, a tricking people into thinking one thing or like, just, just, yeah, man, they want to wear this shoe and then they want to go try this shoe. They want to drive this car and they want to like, Mm -hmm. like champion that and encourage them. Um, So yeah, that's, that's kind of like where I generally start. Uh, The last thing I would say is uh, you really need to think about the, the lens that you're seeing things through. 
uh, with a product, uh, whether it's your refrigerator, whether it's your roaster, your your machine. Like at the end of the day, like this thing is a revenue generating asset, or it's a part of it. So that's kind of one of those things, like putting it in its proper place, uh, and you know that that kind of I think would help make that decision a little bit easier. So in, in a sense, um, I mean, you have to know what you value. But yes. I guess it's also true that you have to know that what you value will change over time. Uh, oh, absolutely, dude. So my mind immediately goes to so many coffee bars that value an aesthetic or having, mm -hmm. quote unquote, the best because it's so, yes. uh, you know, it's a, a statement. But they leave, in a sense, thousands of dollars on the table because they're not using the features to their capacity. They're basically mm. could have easily bought a uh, just flip it on, flip it off. You know, it doesn't doesn't matter because that's, that's what right. they have the capacity to train their staff to do. You're but they didn't right. think of that until it's, it's actually there. So the next time they make a purchase, they're it, it would seem like they're less likely to make that decision again. How do you balance that? Like when you're talking to people, <laughs> you say, yeah. you know what, in three years, you're going to have different values, but I want to meet you in the middle maybe to say right. yes, but also. So what, one, uh, I, I won't mention the brand. There was, a org, there was a group that reached out to me many years ago and they're developing a product. And so I sat down with them and they're mad talented, like international agency, like super talented. After the first meeting, I realized they didn't know what they didn't know. And they were moving into a segment that they didn't have experience. And even though they do work for the three M's of the world and um, the GEs and all this, they were going into a segment that they were only as good as their consultants or their inputs. Mm. And so that's, that's one part for me. I was like, man, you can have all the money in the world and all this, but if, if you're going in that realm and that's out of your lane, like you literally are only as good as your own research and your own tried and true consultants. So I take that, um, I guess, responsibility very seriously. And I don't want to manipulate someone, but I definitely want to curate for them. And that's contextually listening to them. I'm trying to understand, okay, like, uh, I hear you say this, do you mean this? And good architects do this, good therapists do this, like, good, I mean, really good strategists do this. It's learning how to ask really good questions. That's like, that's the, I mean, have good ethics, ask really good questions, and then like have the person express what they want and need. But your journey is to try to like extrapolate that a little bit instead of just uh, feeding them, you know? Oh, I hear drive-through. Okay, let's put a super automatic machine. Oh, I hear this, let's do this. And it's like, well, actually, uh, it may make sense in that area in this what if we achieved automation through let's say you know a super fast grinder like a rover s and you're going to get 18 grams in two and a half seconds and then let's put a puck press and let's have an auto volumetric based machine train the people and that thing's going to crush like very fast uh but again the the pain point there is the the training point as you mentioned and also you don't want to sell them more of a machine than they need. I mean, that's that's the other part for me. Uh, I I like to read a lot of like uh, you know kind of strategy type books and uh, psychology and, and business. And there's a there's a guy I really like who he basically talks about uh, people oftentimes will will overestimate what they think they're going to be able to like accomplish, um, and they're they're usually kind of on the flip side going to go down this realm of, of uh, underestimating uh, what how long it's going to take to, to do that. And so when I think about like a, a product, they're going to overestimate like, oh, I'm going to need this and this and this. And you underestimate uh, in a short term, like, like, hey, do I actually need this? Or what's the cost benefit and all this sort of stuff? So, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to help in that realm, like understand what do you actually need? I know you say you want this, but do you really need that? And then Hey, like, let me help you here. And I'll give one little sentiment with this. There's a shop in the Midwest that I was, you know, going and checking out and they're doing serious numbers, like uh, $8,000 days and crushing it. And they're doing all this on a, a two group linea EE. And, and they had a couple uh, rovers and, uh, but 
when I went in there, I'm like, okay, you guys are double barring really well. Um, but I can hear the grinders are straining. You probably haven't changed your burrs in a while. And I watched and I, I saw, oh yeah, it's taking five seconds to grind. Like those burrs need to be changed. The, the grinder's fine. You just got to change your burrs. Uh, and then I'm watching them and like, they're spending so much energy watching shots and this. And so I was like, you know what? I think honestly, if we added another group and you did uh, auto volumetrics, um, and in this case, I was like, I, I would, I would entertain scale integration and then added a puck press. I bet we could design a, a flow that's going to be much more fluid. And, and it was basically, they trusted me and, and I also made it easy for them because I was there, I was present. I listened to them. I watched, I didn't just like come in with some sort of pitch and it was funny, like a month later, uh, you know, the business owner's like, man, that was incredible. I wish I would have done that so much, so much, you know, earlier. Um, but he, this is a very successful business owner who's been in the industry for a long time, but they were in a, they were in a, a kind of a rut of decision. Like they would always do the same thing. Um, so that's, that's the other part. It's like, just because you've been at it for a long time, doesn't mean you know everything about it. Like you, you probably don't have the time to go through the analysis and the comparison of every update and product development. Um, so anyways, that's, that's kind of the other part. It's funny because you, uh, talk about people who are about to make decisions on equipment who have basically no experience in the industry. And there's this, yep. don't, you don't know what you don't know, fear. Yep. Then you talk about this, uh, business owner who has a lot of industry experience, but has basically the same fear, even with all that experience. Totally. Yes. Yes, dude. It's, it's the exact same, uh, dynamic. And that's where I think all of us, myself included yourself, there needs to be a level of, uh, humility, a level of man, the, the, there's a wide swath of how to get this done. And, you know, if it's a matter of getting from your home to your job, um, then yes, this is the cheapest possible way to execute that. Um, if it's a matter of, you know what, but I, I kind of want to enjoy that ride and I make phone calls. Okay. Then we need to talk about, uh, you know, the kind of more fit and finish the comfort of that car. And, um, <laughs> those are like you start getting into all these elements where it starts to become, oh, I guess I thought I needed this, but I I'm feeling like my wants are in, are uh, affecting my needs. And to your earlier point with the house thing. That's the same thing, dude. My wife and I have lived around the world. We like to live very simple, minimalist, and uh, you know we don't need a lot of space. But the thing is, as you get more and more space, you're like, oh, this is kind of nice. I, I kind of like this, you know. Like you start your preferences start changing, even though what really matters to you is still there. Um, so yeah, with the with the different person, like if one of the listeners is, let's say they have their one uh, shop. And they they got this one set of equipment, they got this one set up, um, and they've seen maybe some other things happening around the country. And they're thinking about this. Do your research, like always do your research. Like, how is it supported? Uh, can you call and be like accessible uh, with with people? Like, is someone going to pick up the phone? Uh, what's parts availability like? What's education? Yes, all those sorts of normal things. And then from there, you start going into, okay, this is where you are. Where do you want to go? Like, what are you, what are you trying to do? Do you want to be that shop that let's say when someone orders an espresso, um, you, you've trained your baristas that they pull a shop for themselves. They do a very quick calibration, whether it's grind flow adjustment, something, and then they serve that shop to someone like, is that the kind of level of prominence that you want to be at? Or is it, you know what? I just need to turn and burn. I just need to throw out all these drinks and I just need this thing to work. I don't really care as much in this. Okay, cool. So we're talking a different like priority set um, within there, but yeah, that's, that's, that's a big thing. I would say, I don't assume things as much with when I pick the phone or I talk or I meet some business owner, even if they're like, Oh, I've been doing this 20 years. Like you could be doing the same thing the wrong way for 20 years and it's totally fine for you. But uh, you know, it doesn't mean we need to replicate that for the next location. Uh, so so yeah, just try to like kind of sprinkle in a little bit like, hey, you ever thought about this? And oftentimes sentiments of like other people or other places. Uh, I'll give you this example, dude. I was in Riga in um, Eastern Europe and probably one of the best cafe pastry experiences I've had. They didn't have a, a built out kitchen. It was literally a back counter 
with a little mixer in this tiny, tiny convection oven, <laughs> but the skill of the baker, the quality of the ingredients, they were doing these little Portuguese egg tarts and they're banging, like just incredible. And it's like, yeah, you have really good inputs. You have really good talent. You don't need this crazy $300,000 kitchen. Um, like you can, you can execute small. Um, so that's, that's like usually a big part before you start like buying that 20 kilo roaster with this, like, are you actually roasting right now? Are you like, uh, do, you, do you know how to like buy coffee? Like, do you know, okay, cool. Let's take baby steps there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the knowing how to grow intelligently, I guess, uh, would be one of those points. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I hope, I hope that helps. No, that absolutely does. Um, and you, you reminded me of one of my favorite bars, um, Abrasso in New York city. Yeah. Uh, Dude, which is, banging. Yeah. Yes. Portuguese also. For banging. Embrace. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Small, small kitchen, amazing baked goods. And uh, I've always thought this is, this is all, all you need really. Yeah. He, he, I would, I, I've actually brought him up a number of times, uh, as he envelops like this experience and this hospitality when you walk in and you're getting this experience and, and yeah, man, I don't know. It, it can inspire so many places and concept bad wolf, which is no longer around was in Chicago. And then he opened up in uh, South Carolina. He, he was a chef at uh, Momofuku Co. And he would go in there and he's like, man, this is awesome. Like I want to open a coffee shop. He literally opened a coffee shop, no, no background. And he was baking some of the best cannelays in Queen Amon in Chicago. It was amazing. Um, but that was, it was from the inspiration of a shop. So yeah. that's the other like encouraging part that kind of like, Hey, what actually got you into this? Like if it is actually having the ability to take that person's ritual of grabbing a coffee and kind of like setting them on a path of inspiration or community, whatever, like do that, do it in a, in a meaningful, authentic way. If you're just trying to make money, in my world, I'm a little bit more like, cool, like do your thing. Um, but I kind of want to help people who are trying to make maybe a bigger impact and helping a broader community of people. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not to, uh, muddy the water with more, uh, uh, examples or analogies, but you, you know, I'm thinking about the fact that so many, I well, don't forget the percentage of people who win the lottery end up losing that money pretty quickly. <sighs> Uh, because the uh, the chances, the statistical chances of them having already developed good habits in money is, is low. And, and so that's right. starting with, um, you know, the right amount of responsibility in small amounts over time, it's like you, you could buy that five group La Marsoca that you want, <laughs> you know, uh, the mythical five group. Um, yeah. But yeah. you you probably won't use it and th it's the same concept you know it's going to be more of a weight around your neck than some a, a step up in the right direction that's right so i mean when we're talking about wants and needs you know my mind immediately goes to the fact that needs are harder to predict than wants um they require a lot of walking out hypotheticals based on your your menu and your location, your your projections. But let's say that we've done that um, in and we're looking to get a, a, a good machine for our needs um, that we'll also look at and be really happy with. I mean, what are the mechanical and you know the configuration elements of espresso machines that people need to be aware of when it comes to like groups uh, capacity features that would benefit um, varying styles of coffee bars as you've seen i'm sure it breaks down into certain categories of users that would benefit maybe from more groups versus um bells and whistles like the the uh, scales built in uh, yep. all that stuff so how do you break that down when it comes to features that you have to actually make a decision on the first thing i start thinking as you're describing that is people have this really bad habit of like they will start talking to a person in a very specific area in the way that themselves understand that category so I start understanding in systems and like uh, segmentations, but for maybe certain segments of your listeners, they're thinking like, oh, it like looks this way, or it kind of, I don't know, it just feels right. It, they, they don't like draw off in this realm. Oftentimes, like my wife, I'll, 
I'll read her a little excerpt of a book and she'll like roll her eyes to be like, what are you talking about? Like this, I don't care about this at all. Um, but I, I think it's kind of the contextualization. Okay, well, when I start talking about the a machine and I say dual boiler and heat exchanger, if that doesn't like get it going for you or like mean much, what about um, when you go to pull that shot, um, you can know that the espresso is, isn't going to taste more sour and uh, like uh, more towards this harsh bitterness every third shot or so, because through a heat exchanging system, you have a, a inherent design element of fluctuation based on throughput. Like it's just, those are, that's, that's the limit of that design. And there's certain innovations and improvements that you can get, but you have, uh, you have um, handoffs basically. So if, if you start integrating brass, Brass is a metal that has um, really off-put uh, exchanges with uh, water, like flavor. It's 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 not a good uh, pathway. So like you know things like this, like that may not mean much to someone. Oh, this is a copper boiler. There's this. Like they won't care, but they will care about the end result. So you know, high level, I would say, cool. How's it composed? Like how does it heat water? Um, is it you know like example PID? Just think consistent is the steam boiler PID. Okay, cool. Like you get into these certain elements uh, and then you start getting into more, how easy is it to work on this thing? Like what bolts do I take off to actually uh, get, get this level of accessibility um, and working on it? You know, you see these memes of, a, of, a, of an oil filter uh, taken off a car and it, it hits like a strut or something like that. And it's like, who, who was the engineer who like designed this? Right. Uh, so there, there is that level of like, Hey, what's it like teching on it? But then the other part of just the function, like I am a kind of a big nerd about, uh, user experience and tac tactile elements and lighting temperatures and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to nerd out about, hey, how does this handle feel? And how is this button when I activate this or this paddle? Um, so there is that very real, if you value that and you care about that, then yeah, start understanding that, um, you know, from there, you, you really start, yeah, you, you do get into things like if I'm doing a coffee cart, let's say, let's say one of your listeners is wanting to do a, um, a trailer and okay, I want a, a single group machine because that's what I can afford. Inherently, you're talking probably 110. And so there's going to be certain limits that that machine can produce. And then they look at, well, what's the difference between, let's say, I don't know, like a machine by Breville or Slayer or Lummer's Oak or, the, you know, whatever. You can, you can look on, okay, this is what sort of wattage I have. Um, and that, that's like a start and that's helpful, but you do have to kind of get a little bit further in understanding throughputs and just abilities and capabilities and then capacity. So even like what's the steam boiler capacity and what was the heating element here? And okay, cool. Like, I think uh, this is actually going to get me through it. And then making sure you're properly sized because you might be like, you know what? I actually need to get a two group. If I'm going to have this line for one hour of 50 drinks, I'm just going to get crushed on these 16 ounce lattes. There's no way it's not like I'm expecting too much from this thing. So um, right. that's that interesting little part. And I think you and I talked about this before of like, Hey, this machine will get the job done. Like if we're talking about like your true need, um, like this is going to get this done. Uh, the, the need element is very, very hard. It's super, super hard because at the end of the day, Hey, uh, I need to get some pair of shoes. Cool. Just go to that use uh, the, um, goodwill and go get the cheapest pair of shoes. Well, no, I have this much money and I want this. So your want is, is in a subversive way infused in your need. And it's almost like, like preventing you from having a true H2O need. Uh, you kind of think you deserve this or this mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So that's, that is that very hard part of like, yeah, you want to open a coffee shop and you need something that's going to be able to press this finely ground coffee through a uh, chamber and yield this, this magical liquid that you can now charge five X what your costs are. Um, great. Like <laughs> there's a lot of things that can do this. Uh, it just hits that whole realm of, you know, the aesthetics, the workflow, the speed, uh, reliability, all those sort of, uh, 
elements, you know, yeah. and even, even like, yeah, last thing I would say with this is like, even say, okay, fine, Chad, like, that's fine. Why do you guys make all these different products? Then that's that whole other conversation of, yeah, there's certain elements of there's actual technological differences. And then there's certain elements that there's a user experience difference, you know, like uh, the drain depth on a, a Strata, there's certain people, that's the main reason they buy it because they love the workflow of that, that the way that drain tray is organized and the openness of the groups. And it's like, okay, like that's nothing about individual boilers and, you know, uh, solenoid based steam ones and all the, all the things that our engineering department loves uh, for the end customer. That's, that's not it, you know. For a lot of people, they just want their business to be successful and they don't want the espresso machine to get in the way. Um, mm. They, they, say, I'm going to spend this much money. I want it to work. It's, I mean, it's the reason why people buy Camrys, right? Versus Dude. other types of cars. So, and, and I'd say that's a pretty big uh, segment of the market out there is just, they just want it to be reliable and they want it to work. But then there's the, there's what you say, you know, there, I have this image of myself with the particular type or style. Or, so when you're talking about balancing needs, you really only have the ability to satisfy a certain set of needs or perceived needs and then you have to take a bunch of other stuff and put it aside. Mostly people are looking at things like, okay, how many groups do I need? Um, and, and they're looking at, uh, you know, just the, the size of capacity of it, but it's hard for them to make that decision um, because they don't know if that's the right priority at the moment. Because a lot of people say, I'm just going to do this coffee bar concept with a one group home espresso machine. And I've had to talk to people about this, like, I, I think we're. If you think about how many people you're going to serve, and all the downtime and the ripple effect of that on your business, and you want your business to be successful, then we might reconsider that. So, mm. if you had to prioritize for somebody, like they said, look, Chad, okay, I don't trust my own thinking. What are like <laughs> the top three priorities yeah. that I should look yeah. for in an espresso machine for a, a mid-size, small, mid-size coffee bar? As you mentioned, the single group, what instantly my brain hit was like, oh yeah, dude, what about Indonesia? What about these parts of the world that they're not as busy and uh, they they want like a lower cost of entry? Uh, you're seeing a lot of single groups uh, mm -hmm. starting, but I think they're probably uh, migrating up to two groups as cash is available and things like that. Um, so anyway, that was like one little segment. I was like, oh, I'm wondering if in the US we're going to see this this growth of people buying really good quality, but maybe right sized and then upgrading quicker, um, which, you know, that's a whole other thing. But if I, yeah, if someone's like, yo, help me, this is what I'm trying to do. Um, first thing I'm probably gonna look at is space. Like, like what, what is your actual footprint that you have allocated um, to, to the machine? Uh, and I, I wouldn't say just the, the espresso machine, but like grinders, all that sort of stuff. Like, let's, let's see, what sort of space and then from there uh that's that's also incorporating uh ensuring the simple stuff of like all right what is your capacity of water of uh, uh electrical yeah, if if instantly you're like oh man like there's no way i can do above 30 amp service cool like we're we're literally not entertaining anything above two groups um you know in in la Marzocco's line specifically because we we try to have so much firepower in the um heating capacity on the steam and and uh, brew boilers, we we require 50 amp service for three three groups. So already you have like a, a limit that you're you're not exceeding. Um, and a lot of this, as I'm talking this way, I try to talk in the realm of constraints. Like uh, freedom uh, is only good to the extent of like you work within your constraints. If you just like, oh, I can do anything, like your constraints will actually lead you to the realm that you make the most optimal decision. Um, so then the next point, I would say, okay, what is your cash allocation like for this? Uh, have you done a performa? And if they've done a performa, like, oh yeah, I wanna spend this much money. And from there, it's like, cool. How much, how much are you trying to do with your coffee program? And if they're trying to do, let's say this, this uh, you know, high number, whatever, 2000 bucks a day or something for their coffee program, but then they have a very low capital investment allocation for their coffee program, I would probably help them understand a little bit. So you're expecting it to do this and you want this result. Um, what's, what's causing you to not make that investment upfront. Um, so from there, 
then we can actually get into real things. We have a number, we have a space allocation, we have the electrical um, co you know, constraint. And then it's like simple stuff. Okay, cool. Like, let's talk workflow. Let's talk this. Like, where do you value certain things? Uh, whether it's, you know, the coffee quality or hey, I just want it to work. Cool. Like, if you've never gotten into coffee, like uh, Alinea is killer. It's They've been making this machine since the late 80s, pretty much. Like, we're, <laughs> this thing is, is tried and true and tested. But you'll see other people. Well, I, I see those all around town. I want something different. So now it's their need has been augmented um, based upon other like external forces. Um, so, so now we're talking about something else, not based on the true real, like actual need um, at that point. And, and yeah, I mean, with, with so many different manufacturers, I mean, very point blank, La Marzocca literally, uh, they, they created the market of this, this crazy pressure profiling with Estrada EP number of years ago. And most people had no clue what that machine was. And you're seeing all these developments recently about pressure manipulation and uh, adjustments. And it's like, is that solving a real need? Is that actual something that's going to help their business be more profitable and the more reliable machine? If not, then that goes more in the, you know, person, maybe they just want to drive that audi a8 but they're just cruising at 50 miles per hour through town like it's not about racing you know it's about something else uh just how they're they're cruising with it so uh yeah other than that man i i, I think yeah we can obviously get lost in all these elements of how auto volumetrics function and the advantages potentially with a solenoid based steam valve but then maybe you know, you have, uh, you know, elements of, well, I do like this idea of individual brew boilers. I mean, dude, you've been in the industry for a minute. How many times you go into a shop and you ask like, oh, uh, like, what do you have the temperature set on your espresso? If you get something, you taste it. And, and almost always nowadays, I will talk with people and people don't touch the temperature on their espresso machine. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that was the singular point uh, in the early 2000s where roasters we're having this eye-opening moment where they're like, oh, I can uh, drop down my temp a little bit and I don't show roast as much in this espresso. And like nowadays it's like this afterthought thing that people don't do, but then they go and manicure over here with the, um, you know, puck preparation and they weigh things out and ratios. And it's like, you know, just understand what the machine can actually do and then use it to your advantage. Um, so yeah, all that to say that that's kind of, some of those elements where I start helping someone steer like, okay, this is, this is what I think is going to actually be really helpful and important to you. Um, so, you know, if someone's talking about high volume, uh, crazy workflow, then I'm like, cool, let's talk about elements of literally the KB90 as a product that's designed with the barista's, uh, benefit in mind, you know, uh, workflow wise, uh, health wise, service wise, all these elements, but then don't get a like super jolly next to it. Like, let's talk about right matching of things, you know, <laughs> um, like let's be intelligent about that. And I, you know, I shared this with you earlier, like there was a time when everybody had, let's say like Bungie one grinders. And then all of a sudden they had the funding and allocations for an EK 43 and how much of that was based on like an up uh, a change in their need set of like coffee extraction or how much of it was based upon, you know, a, a certain performance by a barista champion. Like that's, that, that's that real part where it's like, I want you to be happy, but I also want you to make the decision that really fits what you kind of need. And there should be a level of one because at the end of the day, you're putting your energy and time into this thing. Like you should actually enjoy it, you know? And that's, I would say the reason why people are moving from, Camrys to Teslas, uh, there's a level of, oh, this is fun and it's more affordable now. So yeah, there you yeah. go. Good point. And you know, no matter what you end up getting, you still have to be involved, you know, in, yes. in finessing it, in maintaining it and using it to its uh, capacity, training people. Uh, it's not just a, a one and done. You could put a lot of energy into doing, but you know, making the right decision. But afterwards, if, if it's not going to be uh, you know, cared for in, in your, the input, you know, considering yourself that uh, expert input, then it easily could get to the situation where it starts to become a, a game of blaming the equipment when 
in fact, it, it just might be under investing in um, using that equipment well. Dude, absolutely. I I will not name the manufacturer, but there was a there's a recent customer who approached me and they had a multiple locations and they just bought this new product and they're like, oh, I just keep having all these issues with it and this and this and this. And I just want to rip these out, return it to the manufacturer. I want to buy, I want to buy buy something from you. And I would just start asking questions and listening. And it became very apparent. Yes, there were some elements with the, the machine that they were talking about, but I, I think there were there were some other elements that it was a water quality issue. And so I just very point blank, like, yo, let's address that. Let's start here. I'm looking up the water quality report in your area. It looks like you have uh, some potential issues with chlorides. You're definitely really high in hardness. So um, do you have like RO and is it calibrated? If not, no matter what you put in there, you're going to have to deal with that problem, you know? So, so that's, that's the other like really tricky part, um, understanding the proper like um, buckets, like dealing with all the little buckets. And then it's like, all right, cool. Like, yes, I think I can help you. Chad, this has really been fun to talk. Um, and like you mentioned, there's an infinite amount of you know, subjects within this subject that we could talk about. And uh, I appreciate you breaking down your philosophy on you know equipment and its proper role in the cafe. And all of this is re- just really helpful. If uh, people want to contact you and learn more about uh, what you do and also just learn more about La Marisoco in general, how can they uh, stay in touch? Yeah. Uh, well, we, I think have a a pretty sharp, uh, web presence. So you can, uh, you know, I I would say start there, explore the website in that sort of realm. I would say there's a thing called the product collection. That's pretty helpful. Um, where you, it's actually designed to kind of help navigate you through the process of your needs. And, and, uh, once, you know, at the end of there, that kind of has easy access points with phone numbers and emails, my email, happy to share it. It's just Chad at Lamarsoco dot com and yeah honestly we're always happy to talk with people in the industry at the end of the day like we want to work with people who want to work with us and uh we want to try to help people so yeah i'd be happy to help awesome well thanks for joining us again and uh for all you do thank you man my pleasure okay everybody well i hope that that was a conversation that helped equip you to make some good decisions and to get inside your own mind and to parse out What are your values? What are the needs of your business? How do those two things meet? And how can you approach big decisions on uh, equipment and to help you become an active part of creating uh, success with the equipment that you do have? A big thank you to Chad Little of La Marzoco USA for joining us on the show. Um, As he said, of course, you can go to their website, lamarzocousa.com. You can see all the different types of machines and go to their guide to help you in this process. You can also contact Chad directly by emailing him over at chad at lamarzoco.com. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback from me about this episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, feel free to email me, chris at keys to the shop.com. That's also where you can send a message to inquire about keys to the shop consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, November 5th and 6th is Portland, Oregon Coffee Fest. That's the Coffee Fest Pacific Northwest, the last show of 2021. Um, and I hope to see you there. You know, we're going to have four more shows lined up for 2022. That's going to be in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and then in Seattle. And if you're not familiar with Coffee Fest, uh, it is essentially for over 25 years been the number one event to go to to enrich yourself and equip yourself to be successful in specialty coffee retail. On top of the trade show floor, the networking and events that surround the competition, there is an incredible lineup of uh, workshops, seminars, trainings, that are either free or very accessibly priced. Go to coffeefest.com to learn more about what's on offer. Also, be sure to check out CoffeeFest365, their new learning platform that has just launched. I hope to see you at these events. I'm going to be giving seminars at all of them, and I would love to say hi. Again, learn more information about all of this over at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show today. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I hope it was a truly educational and helpful episode with Chad Little of La Marzocco USA. Have an amazing day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you 
keys to the shop.